Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 6. Chapter 6 is about the fundamentals of convection. We did the first two paragraphs, which was just the basics of convection, and also a little bit on the classification of fluid flows. Today we're going to start with paragraph 6.3, the velocity boundary layer, and we are going to do the thermal boundary layer, laminar and turbulent flows, uh, and I think that would be enough for today. And the lecture after that, we're still going to address the derivation of the differential convection equations, the solution of convective equations, the non-dimensionalized convection equations, and then the functional forms of friction and convection, and then lastly, the analogies between momentum and heat transfer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's start. Can I have all your attention, please? Okay. Paragraph 6.3, the velocity boundary layer. It's a little bit of revision in terms of what you've already done in fluid, in fluid mechanics, but it is important because it's going to link very directly with the heat transfer part of the thermal boundary layer. So just for revision, let's consider again the flow over a flat plate. And this flow is exposed to a uniform velocity distribution with a velocity equal to V. A velocity V, the upstream flow to the flat plate. And the coordinate system of the flat plate, we normally put it here at the leading edge, X and Y. And we know what is going to happen is when this flow gets to the wall, it is going to deaccelerate until its velocity is equal to zero. And then it is going to, let's call it, grab the molecule next, next to it and deaccelerate that one also. And this chain reaction forms the boundary layer. The boundary layer has three parts. Three different distinct parts, all with different characteristics. The first part is the laminar boundary layer. Where we have laminar flow, all the flow moves in laminates, that is where the name comes from, next to each other, okay, or in an orderly fashion, next to each other. Then an air uh, flow regime, which is called the transitional flow regime. Not a lot of research has been done on that. A little bit of an unknown flow regime in terms of many properties that still needs to be determined. And then the last part is the turbulent flow regime. And in the turbulent flow regime there are lots of mixing and lots of chaos. Okay. Now we measure from the leading edge XCR, which is the critical distance. The critical distance and we, we will get to that just now but if we look at this velocity distribution in the laminar flow regime and we make it a little bit larger then the velocity distribution would typically look like this That would be the free stream velocity V. And if you would go down and you would measure the free stream velocity up to the point where the, where the velocity is equal to 99% of the free stream velocity, then that distance is called the boundary layer thickness, delta. Okay, so that is the boundary layer thickness, delta. And what we also know is that in this region, the viscous forces are much larger than the inertia forces. The viscous forces are much, much larger than that of the inertia forces. While on this side, again, we can consider the flow as inviscid or irrotational. 
gravitational flow. Okay. For all practical purposes, we can say that the viscosity is equal to zero. Okay. We also know that at this point here, the velocity is equal to zero. Okay. And this gradient here is very important. The gradient on the surface. And that is equal to du dy, where y is equal to zero. And we, we will get back to that gradient a little bit later. So that, in a nutshell, is the velocity boundary layer through a flat plate for that part, but this part is also important and its characteristics look a little bit different than in that part. So if we look at that part, we blow it up, if we look at the velocity distribution, then the velocity distribution looks more like something like that. Okay, there is V, V, and let's suppose that is equal to 0.99 times V, <coughs> then that would then be the boundary layer thickness, and again, this gradient here is the u dy, where y is equal to zero. So that is what happens in the boundary layer of flow. Something that we are very interested in is usually the wall shear stress. The wall shear stress and the wall shear stress is tau on the wall is equal to the viscosity multiplied by partial du dy where y is equal to zero. Okay, so this term is the gradient that we are referring to in the laminar flow regime or in the turbulent flow regime. The velocity gradient. And the units of the wall shear stress is newtons per square meter. And this relationship is actually only, only valid for Newtonian fluids. Fortunately, most fluids that we work with in mechanical engineering are Newtonian fluids. Exceptions are blood and plastics, which do not have a Newtonian relationship, and there are special relationships available for that. But we're going to restrict ourselves to Newtonian fluids in this course. Now, this viscosity is called the dynamic viscosity. The dynamic viscosity, or we can write it as the kinematic viscosity, or the dynamic viscosity, which is equal to the viscosity divided by the density. With the units, square meters per second, and this unit of the dynamic viscosity is equal to kilograms per meter per second. So those are the normal units of viscosity. Kilograms per meter second. Just to give you an indication of what happens with viscosity, and it's always something that we have to take into consideration when we work in fluid mechanics or in the thermal flow regime. If we look typically at the characteristics of viscosity as a function of temperature, then in general, 
liquids decrease when the temperature increases while gases does the opposite the viscosity increases as the temperature increases at 20 degrees Celsius and typically one atmosphere it is also good just to have a feeling for the different and the relative values of viscosity and if you go and look in your textbook then you will see that typically air has a viscosity of 0 0.4018 okay, and that would now be the dynamic viscosity and water 0 0.0010 one order of magnitude more than air followed by engine oil now engine oil actually have quite a large range depending on the temperature but about two orders of magnitude higher than that of water and then glycerine about 1.52 another order of magnitude higher just to give you a feeling for the different viscosities of fluids okay now if we look critically at this equation of the wall shear stress which is equal to and I'm going to write it again we multiplied by partial du dy where y is equal to zero then you will see that to evaluate it we need information on the velocities except now for the viscosity we need information on the velocities and taking velocities next to a wall is very very difficult because if you put instrumentation you, instrumentation there you disturb the flow so it's very very difficult to take good measurements next to a wall so what we normally do is we rather say let's represent the wall shear stress by the friction coefficient the friction coefficient multiplied by rho v squared divided by 2 and we do experiments we do experiments at different velocities we measure the shear stress and then we get the friction coefficient so cf is the friction coefficient or also known as the skin friction coefficient the friction coefficient or the skin friction coefficient okay now if we look at the shear stress on a flat plate it's a function of x if we look at this flat plate there's x and we would take measurements of the shear stress then the shear stress is going to do something like that okay. the laminar flow regime in the transition flow regime and in the turbulent flow regime so that is laminar that is turbulent and in between is the transitional flow regime so what we see is that the shear stress just like the local heat transfer coefficient is not a constant the reason for that is we can see it from here as this boundary layer develops this gradient changes it is not a constant okay it changes it is not a constant the result is that the shear stress is a function of x so it is not a constant but for us as engineers usually we are not interested in the local values we would like to typically know what is the total drag on the full plate and therefore we are interested in the average value so if we integrate this divide it by the length of the plate we can determine the average shear stress which might be that value there 
which means that if we look at this equation, then that should actually be the average shear stress is e equal to the average friction coefficient. Of course, again, the friction coefficient is very difficult to measure it locally. So just to make sure, let's indicate there also it is the average friction coefficient. <coughs> okay, that was just a very short summary of what you've done in fluid mechanics of flow over a flat plate. Let's extend it now to the case where we have heat transfer also. Okay, and that is called paragraph 6.4, the thermal boundary layer. The thermal boundary layer. Okay, again, we have a flat plate with a uniform flow field at a certain temperature. Okay, at a certain temperature, at this temperature is a constant. That is the velocity V and the temperature is T infinite, it is constant. Okay. At this point here, if we would now go and plot the temperature, it's not a vector. So let's just plot it in terms of the distance. We, the distance of that line is an indication of the temperature. Okay. So that is equal to T infinite. And again, a boundary layer is going to develop on this plate. But it's going to look, a, the principle is going to be exactly the same, but it is going to look a little bit different. In the sense that if we take measurements here, then again, this distance is going to be T infinite. That is not going to change, it's going to be the same. But if the temperature of the surface of the plate is lower than that temperature, then our temperature profile is going to look like something like that. Okay. So if that is equal to Ts, the surface temperature of the plate, then this distance here, that distance there is going to be Ts. And it's going to increase up to the point where the temperature is equal to that of the free stream temperature. Okay. And this distance now we call delta T, the footnote T to indicate it is the thermal boundary layer, okay, which is different than the velocity boundary layer. Okay. Now delta T is going to be where the velocity is, of the temperature is equal to 0.99 times not T infinite, but T infinite minus Ts. 0.99 times multiplied by T infinite minus Ts. Now where does this now come from? Let's look at a very simple case. Let's suppose, su let's suppose T infinite is 100 degrees Celsius and the surface temperature is equal to zero. Okay. So that would be the thermal boundary layer would be where would be where it is equal to 0.9 times multiplied by 100 minus zero is 100 and that would be at 99 degrees Celsius. Does that make sense? Right. The other case is now let's suppose the same free stream temperature, but now the plate is at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. Where is the boundary layer, the thermal boundary layer thickness going to be? At what temperature? Well, where it is equal to 0.99 times um, 100 minus 20. So we're talking of a delta T of 80 degrees Celsius here. So it is 99 percent of 80 which is equal to 
79.2 degrees Celsius. Now something that we should remember in our previous lecture is in our previous lecture we've derived that the heat transfer coefficient is equal to minus the thermal conductivity of the fluid multiplied by partial dt dy where y is equal to zero divided by ts minus t infinite. So again, the gradient plays a huge role, where previously the shear stress was directly being influenced by the velocity gradient, now the heat transfer rate is being directly being influenced by the temperature gradient. So at this point, that temperature gradient is equal to dt dy, where y is equal to zero. So, it means that the heat transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the temperature gradient. Do you see the similarity? Okay. So the similarity is that we've got the velocity boundary layer, now we've got a temperature boundary layer. Now the velocity varies, through the, through, the, through the boundary layer and how the temperatures vary. In the case of the velocities, the shear stresses, the forces on the wall, were being determined by the velocity gradient. In the case of heat transfer, the heat transfer coefficient is being influenced by the temperature gradient on the wall. Very much similar. Okay. A new variable is the Prandtl number. Prandtl number. <laughs> the Prandtl number is equal to, the definition of it is that it is equal to the molecular diffusivity of momentum divided by the molecular diffusivity of heat. Okay, so the Prandtl number is the ratio of diffusion rate of momentum divided by heat. Momentum divided by heat. And we can write it as the kinematic viscosity divided by alpha or mu multiplied by Cp divided by K. <coughs> and we can also say it is equal to the relative thickness, the relative thickness of the boundary layer thickness of momentum or velocity divided by the boundary layer thickness of the thermal one. Okay. So if we now look at these two different types of boundary layers and we think about it a little bit, and let's call, let's put it here on the left hand side, the boundary layer, which is now the velocity boundary layer, and on this side, the thermal boundary layer. Thermal boundary layer. Okay, so on the boundary layer 
side, it is about the velocity distribution. And the thermal boundary layer side, it is about the temperature distribution. We can now have three different types of scenarios. Three different important types of scenarios. The first one is on the same plate. On the same plate. Okay, now before I draw it there, let's just go back to, to here. If we've got a flat plate now, and we go back to the velocity boundary layer. The velocity boundary layer, BL, is going to look something like that. The thermal boundary layer is going to develop at the same time. And it is also going to be limited to these three different regimes. So the thermal boundary layer can, for example, lie there. Okay. Thermal boundary layer. Boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer. But now if we look at the Prandtl number, the Prandtl number actually tells us, it gives us the ratio of these two boundary layers. Although I've drawn the thermal boundary layer higher than that of the boundary layer, it might be smaller. And that is what we're going to investigate now. So we're going to look at the three different scenarios that we can get. The first scenario is, and I'm just going to draw the first part now of the laminar flow regime. That is delta, the boundary layer thickness. On this side, we can have the thermal boundary layer thickness, which is thicker than that of the boundary layer. So the thermal boundary layer is thicker than the velocity boundary layer. That is the first scenario. The second scenario is our velocity boundary layer is thick in comparison with our thermal boundary layer. Okay. And then the last possibility is where these boundary layer thicknesses are exactly the same. So the boundary layer thickness is equal to the thermal boundary layer thickness. The two are the same thickness. <clears throat> okay. Now for this first case, that would be the case where the Prandtl number is larger than 1. If the Prandtl number is larger than 1, then the thermal boundary layer thickness would be larger than that of the velocity boundary layer. What does it mean? It means heat diffuses slowly. Heat diffuses slowly if the thermal boundary layer is thicker than the velocity boundary layer. The other case is now where the Prandtl number is smaller than 1. If the Prandtl number is smaller than 1, then the heat diffuses very quickly. Heat diffuses very quickly. And then the last case is when Prandtl number is equal to 1, then you're going to see later on there are very special mathematical advantages if that is the case. So one of the advantages, advantages is, in terms of mathematics, there are very special cases that we can consider. Now, so what if there are very special cases that we can consider? When the Prandtl number is equal to 1, then the mathematics becomes easier and there are certain differential equations or certain equations that we can solve. Well, the reason why that is so important is that many gases have a Prandtl number 
which is approximately equal to 1. And for example, air is very close to 1. So it means many of the equations would then be valid. Okay. So gases, and specifically air, have a Prandtl number which is approximately equal to 1. Just as an example, let's look at the typical values of the Prandtl number. If we look at liquid metals, then the Prandtl number is typically 0.03 for a liquid metal. What does it mean? It means the heat is going to diffuse very quickly through that fluid in comparison with another one. For example, mercury is a liquid metal. Heat would diffuse very quickly through it. Then gases. Gases is approximately one. Pranel number. Air, depending on the temperature, about 20 degrees Celsius. I think air is about 0.6 or 0.7. Water. Pranel number approximately 10. One order of magnitude higher than that of gases. Oil. Oil would be about 50. That would mean the heat diffuses very slowly through a medium like oil. And that is the reason why heat is being used in your engine for the protection of heat. Okay. To, op to protect against overheating. And then glycerine. Glycerine approximately 2,000 to 100,000. Okay. Now something which is not being discussed in this specific textbook, and you're going to do that in fluid mechanics, or later on if you do the follow-up course in advanced heat and mass transfer, then you're going to see we are going to derive that the heat transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the thermal conductivity of the fluid divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness. Divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness. So it therefore means that in general we want our thermal boundary layer thicknesses to be very, very thin. The thinner it is, the higher the heat transfer coefficient is going to be. Okay, paragraph 6.5 is laminar and turbulent flow. Laminar and turbulent flow. Okay. It is important that you go and work through this chapter, through this paragraph in detail. I'm just going to highlight a few things. You've done it in fluid mechanics. But remember, as I've mentioned yesterday, we normally use the Reynolds number to indicate to us if the flow is laminar or turbulent. And the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertia forces to the viscous forces, which is equal to the velocity multiplied by a characteristic length divided by the kinematic viscosity, or we can write it as rho multiplied by the velocity multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the viscosity. Okay. And the critical Reynolds number is where the flow changes from laminar to turbulent. The critical num Reynolds number tells us when the flow changes, flow field would change from laminar to turbulent. Okay. Okay, what is turbulent flow again? Turbulent flow is if we would measure the velocity as a function of time with instrumentation which is not so good. Okay. So that would be instrumentation where maybe every second or every third second you take a velocity measurement. If that is the case, then for all practical purposes your velocity 
the velocity that you're going to measure is going to be a constant if the flow is if the flow is turbulent okay however if you have a very very good instrumentation and you can measure the velocity every tenth or every one hundredth of a second then what you're going to get is that the velocity is going to velocity measurements are going to do something like that it's going to fluctuate it's not going to be a constant and that might be in the u direction so what we will see is that the average velocity is a constant but there are fluctuations on it and that would be the same for the velocity in the y direction and in the z direction so the velocity measurements is going to look something like that specifically for turbulent flow for laminar flow for laminar flow our measurements are going to be smooth u v and w no fluctuations on the flow one of the simplest experiments that can be done to indicate when the flow is laminar or turbulent is to take a tube and to put a needle through it and to inject a dye into the flow field if the flow field is laminar then the dye is going to be look something like that it's going to be smooth one line if the flow is turbulent then it's going to do something like that fluctuations in the flow field you also you can also see it if you if you light a cigarette the first part laminar and then the flow changes into turbulent flow okay now this critical Reynolds number when does the flow field changes from laminar to turbulent we use the critical Reynolds number for it and we know as we've discussed yesterday that only for the specific case if it is a tube then the Reynolds critical Reynolds number is approximately 2100 to 2300 that would be for flow through a tube if it's a flat plate then it would be when the critical Reynolds number is approximately 500,000 okay. and something that is very important here is that in this case we would say the Reynolds number is equal to rho V multiplied by the diameter divided by the viscosity and in many cases it is actually a good thing to always indicate on what your Reynolds number is based so the Reynolds number is based on the diameter in the case of a flat plate the Reynolds number is based on the length And the length would be the length from the leading edge not the whole length of the plate so take note the length from the leading edge so if this is the flat plate and we want to know at this point if the flow is laminar or turbulent then that is the length that we consider it on so we, we it is possible to see that on a flat plate doesn't matter how small the velocity is if the plate is long enough then the flow is going to change to turbulent flow isn't it at the stage it is going to change to turbulent flow if the plate is just long enough it is obviously possible to say that look I've got a plate 
and I would like to know the average on the average length or the total length of the plate if the flow be laminar or turbulent if we do the calculation on this total length and this total length is laminar then we will know we've got a laminar flow regime on the whole plate and not only on a part of the plate okay then for an aircraft wing for an aircraft wing, let's suppose it is a specific aircraft wing a, called a NACA and it's got four digits. I'm just going to choose an arbitrary one. These four digits can be, de can be used to determine the thickness ratio divided by the total, total, total ratio of the plate. But that distance is called the court. the court of the aircraft wing and for that case the Reynolds number is going to be calculated by the density multiplied by the velocity multiplied by C <coughs> divided by the viscosity and the Reynolds number where the flow changes from laminar to turbulent maybe for this specific plate or for this specific aircraft wing would be at a Reynolds number of a hundred thousand And then for a cylinder, for a cylinder, the critical Reynolds number would be 2 multiplied by 10 to the 5. If it is a smooth cylinder, if it is smooth, and it would be equal to 4 times 10 to the 4 for a sanded one. Okay, so why is this so important? This is important because, as I've mentioned yesterday, people are just so in it that they always think that flow changes from laminar to turbulent. If the Reynolds number is about 2,100 to 2,300. It is not true. It is only true for flow through tubes. Through other geometries and over other geometries, it depends on the geometry and it depends on what has been used as the characteristic length. Okay, paragraph 6.6 .6, heat and momentum transfer heat and momentum transfer in turbulent flow Okay, heat and momentum transfer in turbulent flow. We are running out of time, so I cannot cover all the material for you, so please go and read it. It is important. But the thing that I want to summarize to you is the following two things. And that is for turbulent flow, what we say is that the total shear stress is now equal to the viscosity plus a turbulent viscosity multiplied by partial du dy where y is equal to zero and that would be the average velocity du dy and for heat transfer for the total heat transfer is equal to minus k plus a thermal k multiplied by partial dt dy and again the average temperature gradient. Okay. Now for both of them, these first two values, okay, these first two values are fluid properties. Fluid properties, as you can get in your handbook. As you can get in your handbook. These two values, however, you cannot get in your textbook okay, because they are not fluid properties. 
they are not fluid properties they are flow properties <coughs> so depending on the application that you consider over a flat plate over a cylinder or over an aircraft wing those flow properties would influence those values ok in the last paragraph very very quickly it's paragraph 6.7 paragraph 6.7 is the derivation listen the derivation of the differential convection equations for continuity which we've done momentum which we've done and energy which we've done you'll just see that the derivations are not that in detail for example the momentum equation does not derive the Navier-Stokes equations so we've done it in more detail in chapter 4 in white just take note of how it has been done here and the equations how we're going to use them later on ladies and gentlemen thank you very much